Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Executive of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our May lecture today. Today's lecture is a follow on from the intellectual property workshops we have hosted previously from Marks and Clark. I'd like to welcome Michael Moore, who is an intellectual property lawyer from Marks and Clark. Michael has over 20 years experience in advising clients internationally on the commercialization, monetization and enforcement of a variety of intellectual property assets. Michael's talk today will provide an overview of the mechanics of a patent infringement case and the timeline and procedure in getting a case to trial. So just before Michael starts, uh, everybody's muted. If you'd like to ask questions, please use the chat at the bottom of the screen and then at the end of the presentation, we can unmute you so you can ask in person. Okay, over to you, Michael. Hello, everybody. Very nice to meet you all. Um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, just bear with me while I try and share my screen. Um, hello, so here's an overview of uh, the talk today. Um, I'm going to start, as Charlie said, just giving an example of a case involving Agritech. Uh, this case actually involved a potato separator. Our firm uh, dealt with the appeal of this matter and uh, it just gives a good context in which to outline some of the main features of the elements of a patent infringement case in the courts. We'll then look at how you get there, so the, the uh, procedure and timelines, and then I'll talk a little bit about working with barristers and experts, which are you know, very important in the UK system. And I'll briefly mention IPEC, that's the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court. It's different to uh, the High Court, uh, the Patents Court in the High Court, it is a venue for lower value disputes and um, to achieve that all the cases are very tightly managed up by the judge and the aim is to reduce expenditure and the timeline to getting a decision. I'll also refer briefly to the UPC, this is the Unified Patents Court. This is a whole brand new court system that is being implemented uh, towards the end of this year and up and running, we expect maybe March uh, 2023. Unfortunately, because of Brexit, we won't have one of the courts of uh, the Unified Patent Court in the UK. Um, they will be distributed amongst uh, EU member states for now. Uh, predominantly France and Germany, but there will be local divisions in Nordic countries and, and other countries. And this is a, the subject of a whole different talk, I think it's fair to say, but I'll briefly uh, mention it. So the case that I'm going to refer to is the Grimmer case against Derek Scott. Um, and as I say, the case related to um, a machine for separating potatoes from the other materials um, that I dragged up when, when harvesting. Um, these machines were, were known and there were already uh, such potato separators on the market, but they're kind of the inventive elements of uh, the patent in question uh, related to the rollers that were used to separate the potatoes from the other materials. So that was the key element of this case. And this is a feature of patent cases whereby, um, you know, it often homes in on a very uh, specific element of uh, an invention. And here it was, it was the rollers. So, you know, the previous, um, previous machines or prior art machines as we, we call them. Um, and I have highlighted in red some of the terms of art that we use that may not be familiar to you. Um, but the prior art machines, they had um, slight disadvantages, which the invention of the patents, Grimmer's patent sought to overcome. So, Grimace sued uh, Mr. Scott for infringement of his patents and also for infringement of unregistered design rights. So as the name suggests, unregistered design rights, no registration required, 
this is something that comes into being automatically and will last for a period of 10 years in the UK. Um, the first five years, there's no license of rights, but the subsequent five years, there is a license of right. If someone wants to license it, you must license them, but you can go to the IPO to agree uh, what the reasonable royalty should be. Uh, Mr. Scott had not sought permission from Grimmer to license the patents or the unregistered design rights, and hence he was sued. Uh, Mr. Scott resisted the claims and sought to revoke uh, the patent. And he also claimed um, relief for unjustified threats of patent infringement. Now, this is a particular feature of UK patent law and um, design law we have and trademarks i should say so across the board of ip rights now uh, we have unjustified threats provisions and ostensibly this is to um protect uh usually vendors from um unjustified claims from rights holders um where they're trying to get a product off the market so they're not going to the maker of the infringing goods or importer of the infringing goods but again to the retailer and often the retailer is not in a position to say whether the goods it is selling are infringing or not because it's just acquired them from uh, an intermediary so um, you just have to be careful when you're writing or communicating with um, potential infringers particularly if they're in the kind of retail downstream um, sectors, uh, because we do have these uh, groundless threat provisions. Anyway, the case uh, got to court and actually was subsequently appealed, but the high court, it was held that claim one of the patents, and, and I'll go through what the claims are, the mechanics of the patent, um, but essentially the claims of a patent are a, a list of numbered points that outline the scope of the monopoly rights you're claiming. So in the high court action, claim one is usually the broadest claim that was held invalid for obviousness over the prior arts, but there were subsequent claims and it was held that claims 17 and 24 of patent were valid and claim 17 was infringed um, because Mr. Scott actually did sell his um, potato separator with these elastomeric rollers, which were the subjects of the Grimmer patent. And that's this improved uh, separation of the potatoes from other materials. Um, but actually, Mr. Um, Scott also sold the machine with steel rollers, which, although um, they did not so called directly infringe claim one he was essentially selling um, this product with steel rollers and was suggesting that you could actually change the steel rollers to put these elastomeric rollers there instead and actually supplied machines uh, or, or supplied elastomeric rollers that you could install. And this is another element of infringement that we have. It's called indirect or contributory infringement. So you are supplying something um, to, to someone in the knowledge that they can actually put the invention into effect themselves. And in this case, that, that merely required replacing the steel rollers uh, with the elastomeric rollers. It was also held that the um, threats of patent infringement uh, were justified in that they were threats but they weren't actionable because in the end, Mr. Scott was found to be infringing. So that was good for Grimmer because if they hadn't made good on their case, then they could have been liable for these ground threats. They, it was found that the threats of infringement of design right were justified. And the reason for that was, even though it was found that unregistered design rights, um, they had been infringed as well, the nature of the threat in the original letters before action was very general that it covered a number of designs and it was actually held that it was only the original um, rollers that Mr. Scott was selling 
which infringed Grimm's unregistered designs, not subsequent rollers. So therefore, um, it, you know, that, that was an unjustified threat. This, um, so, so Mr. Scott lost, uh, but then he had a right to appeal. He appealed, but also Grimmer appealed because they weren't happy about claim one being held invalid. So um, the parties appealed to the Court of Appeal. Essentially, in short, it was the same outcome, apart from the fact that the Court of Appeal held that the judge got it wrong with claim one, he gave too broad an interpretation to claim one, it was narrower, so it was, it was valid, it avoided the prior arts, but importantly, Mr. Scott's uh, machine, evolution machine, was held to infringe it, so it was also direct infringement of claim one. So I said I'd go back to a patent. I don't know if anyone, you, you're familiar with patents, but essentially it's a, you know, a written document. You've got a description outlining the general state of the art, so what's gone before, and how what you are proposing to, uh, to obtain a patent for, how that is an improvement on um, what's gone before and, and usually outline a particular problem uh, that has existed and how you've sought to solve that with your invention. There'll be drawings that detail um, and illustrate what it is um, you say is the invention. And as I say, the claims at the back of the uh, patent documents um, are numbered. You know, you, it could be one to five claims, it could be one to 50 claims. Um, but the important thing is you'll start with a broad claim and then narrow down like a funnel approach where you'll add more and more features. So effectively what you're doing is, is narrowing the scope of each claim because to infringe a claim, you have to take each and every feature. So obviously if a claim has got, you know, 30 features, it's much harder to infringe that claim than a claim that has say four or five uh, features. But the other side of the coin is, so always uh, in, this, in the UK, we're thinking infringement is one side of the coin, but the other side of the coin is validity. And so if you've got a claim that only has a few features, um, it's much easier for, for you to find prior art that may, we say, read on to what you've broadly claimed. And, and the trick of the patent attorney is to uh, give you sufficient strong protection for your invention but that means not only protecting what yeah, the embodiment of what you've invented but you're also trying to future proof it so you're trying to capture further developments that might happen in the future so that's why you'll have a broad claim one for example but then you'll kind of narrow that down with so-called dependent claims which will have more and more features which um, will maybe in a very detailed way ultimately describe what it is, the embodiment of what you, you're going to commercialize. But the broader claim will be a more conceptual idea of what you've um, invented. So here we see we had um, you know, a quite a broad claim one, and then we narrow that down here. Um, with additional features for claim 17 and claim 24. And in fact, actually, you could say claim one, um, there's quite a lot of features there, but actually a lot of them are quite generic to these, these machines. So how, what does the court do when it's, when it's considering um, and infringement and validity. Well, first thing it needs to do is to view the patent through the eyes of the so-called skilled addressee. So this is the person to whom the patent is addressed. So there's a certain objectivity uh, about the court's um, you know, determination of infringement. In this case, uh, the skilled addressee is term was determined to be a designer of agricultural machinery with experience with potatoes and other root crops. The skilled addressee would not necessarily be a potato specialist, 
although he would be familiar with the generally known existing machines for harvesting and separating potatoes. And what would happen in practice is the parties uh, would engage experts to provide expert evidence. And usually now the um, court would uh, you know, require the parties, if they could, to agree who the skilled addressee was. Back in the day, when this case was um, being considered about 12 years ago, um, the parties would make their representations and then the court might intervene and say, well, I think it is one or the other, or, or a blended combination of what the part, respective parties were saying to the addressee. Now, it's much more likely that the court will ask the experts to agree. Similarly of common general knowledge, so you have the person, you've got his skill set, what knowledge does he has? does he have inside his head? And this is the so-called common general knowledge. So this is knowledge that um, it goes without saying that person would have known about. Um, and, and the relevant date is the priority date of the patent. So that's the first filing of the patent anywhere. So for example, um, here, Grimmer are a German company. So they would have filed a German patent application, that would have been their priority filing. And then they could use that date if they filed a subsequent UK patent. Um, the filing dates would be later, but the, the, of the filing dates of the UK patent would be later than the priority date, but they could essentially claim their protection back to the priority date of the German uh, patent. And that's the relevant date for considering whether the patent is valid or not. So everything before the priority date um, is something that could be so-called prior art. And um, in this case, uh, Mr. Scott was able to identify a number of pieces of prior art, which, as I say, in the, the High Court, the first instance decision did invalidate claim one, but that was subsequently overturned by the Court of Appeal. So the prior art could consist of um, prior art patents. It could consist of prior art machines that are, are on the market. It could uh, consist of any um, academic article or uh, advertisement. So anything that is written down or you can prove was, was on the market and a, a prior use may need to be supported uh, with uh, fact evidence of someone who is familiar with that machine and can talk about it more in the round because you may not be able to uh, provide a sample of that prior art machine. So, um, you know, pr prior art is a broad range of materials that can be relied on, but importantly, it's all got to be for the priority date of the patent. So we talked about witnesses, so you can get a fact witness to support your prior arts and we talked about expert witnesses. What's really important is um, the preparation of those uh, witnesses for trial. And it really is a case that those witnesses do need to be objective and be seen to be objective by the court because the evidence that they provide um, in written documents to the court, but then they can be cross-examined on that evidence in the box um, by, by the respective uh, barristers for each side. And, um, you know, unfortunately here in the High Court case, uh, Grimmer's uh, managing director, who is a, a native German speaker, um, he, he, he decided to give his evidence in, in English rather than through a translator, which, you know, he was entitled to do. So he could have given his, his evidence in his mother tongue of German, and that would have been translated to the court in real time. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, part of the reason for the criticism here from the judge is because uh, he chose to speak in English, and I don't think he was entirely comfortable uh, in doing so. And, and also, I think he, 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 he was hard of hearing. I think, um, you know, perhaps uh, more care should have been taken uh, with this witness. In contrast, um, Mr. Scott, although he lost the case, he, he came out of it uh, pretty well because the judge uh, thought that his evidence that he provided 
um, was very sort of straightforward and, and helpful ultimately to the court in arriving at, at his decision, but even though it wasn't helpful for him to stop ultimately. So, you know, much as, you know, we're hearing about the Wagatha Christie case, I mean, it is a very stressful experience to go into court, give evidence and be cross-examined on it. Um, so we spend an awful lot of time uh, speaking with expert witnesses in particular, uh, because their evidence is uh, often key. So we've got the patent, we can see what that says. We were, the court is, in, is construing the, uh, the patents through the eyes of the skilled addressee, uh, through that skilled addressee's common general knowledge, and is looking at um, the details of Mr. Scott's machine. So how is that um, information, the detailed information of Mr. Scott's allegedly infringing machine, how is that presented to the court? Well, rather than provide a disclosure, so you know, disclose documents, you know, a, a manual or something to do with that product or the actual machine itself should be entirely impractical. What parties normally do is provide a product description if it's a product, or if it's an alleged infringing process, you, you provide a process description. It, it could be a product and process description, depending on the nature of the uh, invention. So you provide a product description, that will be agreed with the other side as to whether it goes in suffi into sufficient detail for the other side to make an, uh, its case out. And if not, um, it can go back to court and ask for further and better particulars um, from uh, the defendant. And as I said um, before, we have direct infringement. So that is where what you're um, supplying falls directly within the wording of, of the claims of the patent. And we also have indirect infringement, which is where what you're supplying doesn't have all the features of the claim, but actually you're supplying it in the knowledge that the person to whom you're supplying um, can actually um, add or take away features that will then result in a product or process that falls within the claims of the patent. And here, Mr. Scott was uh, very frank and accepted that he had designed his machine in mind so that the um, steel rollers could be replaced uh, with, with the other infringing uh, rollers. So that was how the court assessed infringement. The other side of the coin is validity. Um, to assess this, the courts are first looking at Novelty is what the patent described as of the priority date. Is that new over what's gone before? Uh, in this case, it was held it was. Is there an inventive step or is it an obvious development over what's gone before? Um, this is a notoriously difficult question to answer. And you know, both sides presented expert evidence to the High Court judge. He determined, for example, that claim one was not inventive over the um, prior art. But then you have an appeal to the Court of Appeal. That appeal judge decides that actually the High Court judge has been in error because the way he's construed the patent has been wrong, it's been too narrow. So therefore that gives the Court of Appeal free reign to consider this question again. And then when they consider it afresh, they decided that Claim 1 actually did have an inventive set over um, the prior art. So it is difficult. This is the kind of vagaries of, of litigation. You may be very, very confident in your case, but on the day, it is a judge who's considering the evidence. And it may be that your fact witnesses or your expert witnesses don't perform very well under pressure. And something like inventive step is something that, you know, you can fall down on quite easily on the day. It's a risk. It's a risk for both sides. Uh, another ground of validity that is considered and was considered in this case is insufficiency. This is where um, the court is testing, has the invention that you're claiming been disclosed uh, 
clearly enough for the skilled addressee to put it into practice. In this case, it was held that it was. Another ground for invalidity is added matter, and this arose in this case as well. Um, so added matter is where you may, made, may have made an amendment to your patent during prosecution, and it could be later than prosecution as well, whereby you're amending the claims in a way that broadens the scope of protection um, than what you originally disclosed in your priority filing. And this is fatal. If, if this happens, your patent is dead in the water. So thankfully, in this case, Grimmer survived uh, this attack and uh, they prevailed in the action ultimately. So here's just a recap. Um, essentially, the patent was held valid and infringed and upheld. And in fact, the scope of the infringement increased um, when the Court of Appeal looked at it. Also, luckily for Grimmer, um, they prevailed on infringements, therefore the claim of unjustified threats went away. But as I say, if they hadn't prevailed, then they would have had uh, cost consequences um, and perhaps damages as a result of that counterclaim from Mr. Scott. So that's the kind of basic mechanics of the case. Please um, ask me questions on that. So just try to give an overview of what's involved. Similarly, with regard to procedure and timelines, I'm just gonna give an overview, but please um, do ask questions after this uh, presentation. So first step is you've identified infringement. There's usually a less for actions so for pre-action correspondence. Again, that needs to be very carefully worded to avoid threats. Usually it can be possible to resolve matters in pre-action correspondence, uh, but ultimately it may be necessary. You can easily spend a lot of money on pre-action correspondence. Um, and a patentee with a strong claim is well advised to, once it's um, put on notice, the infringement, and if it feels as though the putative infringer is dragging its feet, it, you know, it may be well advised just to commence an action because often that can crystallize a settlement. And in the UK, the so-called statements of cases is your, your claim form, your particulars of claim, they're all very outline in nature. So, you know, it, it's not expensive to prepare those documents. The filing fee can be expensive at the High Court depending on, and that will depend on the value of the claim. But, you know, as I say, you've got to balance the uh, cost benefit of, of the action in hand. Um, and sometimes it, it can be um, worthwhile commencing that action sooner rather than later. Because then you're on a timeline, then the putative infringes on a, on a timeline, so the defendant now, if, if uh, proceedings have been issued. You, one of the first things you want to do once you issue is, trying to agree trial dates even before the case management conference. And, you know, we'll work very closely with the barristers, clerks uh, to do that. Ultimately, you'll then have a case management conference um, where the judge will set the timetable for the case and, and you know, set out what the parties can and can't do during the course of the action. And the courts are very keen now in the High Court to, once an action is issued, to try and get a hearing within 12 months. That doesn't always happen. It depends on how busy the courts are. Uh, this year, the courts are, are not as busy as they have been in previous years. So you are able to get your, your action on, uh, depending on how long the case is, of course, um, within 12 months. The main uh, things that the judge will be looking at in the case management conference are, you know, get the parties to admit where they can uh, each um, side's case. So you're narrowing the issues and disputes. It may be necessary for there to be disclosure and inspection of documents. 
uh, this is an aspect of UK law, which is now, or UK procedure, which is now very much tightly managed um, because it has been found that this is a very expensive element of UK proceedings, more so in the US where they call it discovery, um, and it can take on a life of its own. And you can imagine the time spent on finding documents, disclosing those to your side, and then having those documents inspected to see if there's any relevance there. And in the US, certainly, discovery can be used as a fishing expedition to find a smoking gun. Um, that is not something that is permissible in the UK. And now more and more courts are employing a cost benefit analysis to, okay, what disclosure do you want? Why is this relevant to um, assisting the court in resolving uh, the facts and disputes? And you've really got to be able to address those questions uh, to obtain disclosure. Similarly, with experiments and models, if they're required to prove infringement or to prove non-infringement, um, then the parties will have to make out that case before any uh, such order is granted. It is usual for the parties to be allowed to appoint an expert each. Uh, in some cases, there'll be um, a jointly appointed expert, but usually each party can appoint their own experts. Um, there will need to be agreement, as I say, on who the skilled addressee is and therefore whether um, you know, you'll be very keen to make sure that your expert ticks the boxes of experience to enable them to be in a good position as of the priority date to make an assessment on uh, particularly the prior art and whether it was something or common general knowledge, whether it was indeed common general knowledge and um, to argue the case for infringement or non-infringement this case may be. Uh, witnesses of facts can be very helpful. Um, but, you know, I think they need to be um, you know, very, very open with the, the court for their evidence to be um, effective. Uh, the trial itself, the, um, the judge at the case management conference will have to make a determination on um, whether the case is very technical or not. In this case, it was a very straightforward case, but in highly uh, technical cases, like in biotech cases, you will um, expect to have a um, senior uh, IP judge uh, dealing with that case. Um, and of course, here in this case, we had uh, an appeal. So that's something that would come at the end of the High Court proceedings. And you'd have a you know, short period of time to determine whether you um, wanted to appeal the judgment if you thought the, the judge got it wrong. So here's a schematic of um, those various aspects. And as I say, you are looking at 12 to 14 months um, from issuing a claim to um, the hearing. So actually it's a very compressed period of time to get all these elements together. And if you are the claimant, you will be well advised to um, secure your legal team and um, preferably have a good idea about who your expert is going to be because they are their, their evidence is going to be really important in the case and of course that gives you an advantage because you have um, knowledge that the fact that you're going to take proceedings but the defendant doesn't and that enables you to um, try and get the best available expert who's, who's around. So in the High Court, um, as well as this commitment to try and get trials on 12 months from issue, there are also a number of innovations that are happening. So we've got the streamlined procedure, uh, the flexible trial scheme, and the shorter trial scheme. And essentially, these are all uh, a, menu, a smorgasbord menu to enable uh, parties to try and um, focus on the aspects of a trial that are required to, to do what the determination and deal with the matter and try and cut out, you know, for example, disclosure if it's not, not required. Um, just to try and 
shorten the timeline to trial because that will only, not only give a quicker decision, but it will substantially reduce costs. So similarly here, we've got the shorter trial scheme. Um, again, they're, they're all trying to uh, reduce costs and each of these schemes have, um, you know, different um, elements that need to be fulfilled. So for example, for the shorter trial scheme, the trial at length must be um, no more than four days, including the judges. Uh, reading time, which is usually a day or half a day, depending on the complexity of the case. So I'm a solicitor, but I work uh, hand in hand with a, a barrister or two barristers, a senior and a junior, in a patent case. Um, again, if you're a claimant, you will want to secure your, your barristers at an early stage, because ultimately there are a limited number of you know the, the kind of preferred barristers if you like that you'd like to work with um and that will depend on the right that you are enforcing you know there's maybe a different pool of barristers for patent actions as opposed to copyright matters for example so we develop uh, a strategy in case theory with barristers we work collaboratively with them um, we do most of the heavy lifting with regard to experts evidence that we do um, consult with the barristers because ultimately the barristers will be presenting the case in the courts and therefore we need to be um, the arguments that he's making need to be supported by uh, the evidence that the expert is going to provide ultimately prior to a hearing the barrister will be primarily responsible for putting together the skeleton argument which is the outline of, of the case. And those uh, skills and arguments are exchanged prior to the hearing. So there are no surprises once you go into uh, the trial itself and you can actually um, address points that the other side are going to make. And <clears throat> parallel litigation was mentioned there of it. That means, for example, if there's a case in the UK, there might also be a case in Germany or Netherlands, for example, and therefore it's particularly important to consult with the extended legal team before putting, um, you know, arguments before the court. I should say in the US as well, because if there's parallel US proceedings, then the UK proceedings are, are often going to be first, and because the US is such a bigger market, and there's usually a lot more at stake, we will um, have to work very closely with the US legal team. And in some, you know, some cases, you might need to compromise what you're going to say in the UK action because of strategic considerations in the US. So similarly, as with, ex, uh, with barristers, the search for experts should begin at an early stage. And actually it can be quite difficult to find an expert with the right attributes. You're really looking for someone who is active at the priority date of the patent, uh, but hopefully in a kind of more neutral position um, currently. So if they're recently retired or they're in academia now, that's usually quite good. It's not necessary, but it helps. Um, in terms of sourcing an expert, uh, the client can be a very helpful starting point. Um, as can be the literature we review to assess the common general knowledge and, and the prior art, we can pick up names uh, from that. Um, and there are you know, other organizations we can contact who can put us in contact with relevant um, experts. So it, the meetings themselves with, with experts um, you know, can be on an ongoing basis uh, quite lengthy. Um, we general, generally have a scheme to avoid hindsight reasoning, whereby we would introduce them to the general state of the art and the common general knowledge as we see it with regard to a particular patent. Um, we then get their views on that. We then introduce uh, certain of the prior art that the other side may have 
um, cited to invalidate patents or get their view on, on those bits of prior art. And it's only then once we've got a good sense of the state of the art that we introduce the patent to the experts. And then once we've introduced the patent to the experts and we've you know, considered that and got a good understanding of what he, um, as a skilled addressee, what he thinks that patent is disclosing, it's only then that we introduce the um, infringement, so that the um, inf infringing product or process. So that's a good kind of good uh, best practice scheme for avoiding hindsight uh, reasoning uh, from the uh, your experts. So IPEC, uh, as I said, this is a lower cost venue, uh, much shorter um, time frame. So typo in 0.2. Um, it's very much front loaded. I mentioned statements of case in the High Court, very simple, very straightforward, easy to put together. In IPEC, um, the court really wants you to lay out your case in detail. And um, then at the CMC, the judge will be quite hands on and say, okay, these issues are not in dispute. This is what's, this is the nub of the, the case. Let's just focus, focus on this. And trials in IPEC are to last no more than two days, but we've seen over the last two years that IPEC will accept three day cases. But a big difference here is damages are limited to 500,000. So they are for lower value disputes. But crucially, cost recovery is capped at 50,000. Now, costs in a high court action for a full blooded high court action can cost anything 800,000 to 1 million, 1.2 million, going, going up from there. Costs in IPEC can still run into hundreds of thousands of pounds, but your cost recovery is 50,000. So, you know, if you've got a strong case, you probably want to take it in the high court. Um, if you're not sure of your case, maybe IPEC is, is a good, good venue. UPC, as I say, a new court system. Um, this is launching next year. So it's important now to look at um, opting out if you want to take a conservative uh, strategy, because if your patent is uh, attacked in the UPC, so someone tries to revoke it in the UPC, then that patent is forevermore uh, stuck in, in the UPC. So this will apply to EP patents, not national patents. Um, also, it's important to review your, your agreements to make sure that you have uh, control. If you're a patentee or an exclusive licensee, now will be the time to uh, check those agreements to see what control you have um, over for example, opting out uh, the patents that you own or are licensing in. Right, I'll stop there because um, I want to leave some time for questions. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I think Alan Plum had a question, but he's, that's been answered by Robert. Uh, so I think the first question uh, is from Mark Andrews, who's got a couple of questions actually. Mark, do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you very much. And a question on this Grimmy versus Mr. Scott um, situation. <coughs> if Mr. Scott's design had required uh, the use of Grimmy rollers and components, um, so Grimmy would have made a profit from Mr. Scott's design, um, would, the, would the court case have gone differently or would the fines have been different? Well, in that case um, that you outline, um, it would still be the case that Mr. Scott is using um, the invention of Grimmer's patent. So what um, Mr. Scott would need to have done would be to try and obtain a license um, from Grimmer. And they may have taken the view that uh, Giving it, I mean, depending on how much of a royalty they could have secured from Mr. Mr. Scott, they may have decided that more money was to be made on um, selling the machines themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I, so basically, it's down to um, um, in that sort of situation, it, it's a matter of approaching the, the 
um, the person with the original patent and saying, hey, you know, let's do a commercial deal. Yeah, so, so what we um, tend to do is act for clients, if they're launching a product or a process, you would normally, uh, they would normally ask for a free and to operate search. So um, we'd obtain details of the product and then we would do a patent search to see whether there were any similar patents out there that touched on the proposed product. Um, in some cases, it may be possible to design around the patent. And that's typically what we would do. Um, of course, there's always a risk, there's always a question of interpretation. But in cases where it's not possible to design around, then yes, the client's options are limited, but one of them is to try and reach out and to obtain a license. And in some cases that can work because a patentee is not exploiting the patent in all these markets because you know it, it just isn't set up to, um, to do so. And then the license can uh, provide for uh, a limited geographical, geographical scope of being able to exploit the invention. So the patentee could actually say, okay, I'm not exploit exploiting this in Asia. You're well set up in Asia. You've got distributors there. Uh, I'll license you to do so and you'll pay me the royalty. Yeah, good. And, and, and the second question, which is impossible to answer, but I think would be interesting to ask is, um, what costs more, um, sort of internal and external legal counsel or court costs? Um, how much does a barrister charge per day? Um, uh, it'd be very interesting just to get a, 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 an idea of internal sort of court costs versus court costs. Yeah, um, all right, very much ballpark, you can put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> yeah, say, say if a case is a high court case, full-blooded patent action, say it's four days, um, say that costs a million pounds, then um, the barrister's fees, they're called the brief fees, uh, they're the fees that the barrister will charge for preparing for the case, so preparing all those skeleton arguments and being in court on the day presenting the case. Um, you know, for a million pound action, you might have two barristers. So the proportion of the barristers fees of that million pounds might be 200,000, 300,000. So quite a significant portion. Um, and in terms of, you know, those costs to try and avoid disputes, so FTOs, uh, that, that type of thing, that's much more cost effective when you realize the costs of, uh, you know, dealing with a, a problem, an infringement action. Uh, that can be very, very, very costly. Costs in IPEC, much less, you know, you, you can usually simpler disputes, you can streamline the issues and disputes. Um, you can make sure that action is dealt with um, more efficiently in time, which will save costs. But still, you will, you will likely um, spend more than the 50,000 um, that you could recover in costs, in my opinion. Yeah. But you know, the most important thing for rights holders is to get an injunction to stop the infringing acts, and that, that's the value in, in the action. Yeah, great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Chris Saunders. Question? Yeah, thank you, Michael. You you mentioned the issue of added matter in terms of invalidating a patent, and I didn't quite catch why that was such an important factor. Can you could you re-explain that, please? Yep. So um, when you issue your um, when you file your your patent, you have made a disclosure, um, and the um, the quid pro quo for getting your monopoly is. Uh, that you are disclosing to the world how to work work this um, work this invention, so you know people can you know, develop and go forward and, and make improvements to, to what you uh, disclosed and found. But, and so there has to be um, you know a kind of uh, you know a symmetry between what you disclosed and the monopoly you claim, the monopoly rights which are in the claims of patents. 
And if you amend those claims, so and that, it could be you've you've um, you know, deleted a feature or something which you know, broadens the scope of of that claim. Um, and so therefore, there's an imbalance between the scope of your monopoly and what what you've disclosed. What you claim needs to be dis supported by what you've disclosed in the description. And it can be by accident or design that you've amended the claims in such a way that you've expanded the scope of your claimed monopoly above and beyond what you've disclosed to the world. So that's the original disclosure at the um, uh, priority date yeah. versus a variation that might have come about later than the priority date. That, that's correct. Rob, if you yeah. okay. from a, a, a quick prosecution point of view, do you want to... Yeah, a quick answer? simple example. So you've got a product that you know can make, be made by welding with bits of metal together. And then three years later, three years later during the prosecution, you realise actually you could 3D print it as well. So whereas your claim might have been, might have, your original claim might have said, uh, and you join these two pieces together, and but you then amend that to say these two pieces are joined together, or these two pieces are connected, then suddenly you don't actually have to have the act of joining because a 3D printing might just produce it in one piece. So if you claimed the thing, thing that can now covers 3D printing, whereas before the original disclosure definitely didn't, Claiming the broader subject matter is added subject matter, and that would be yeah, there. sure. And a follow up to that was the fact that um, claim one in this case was actually found to be valid by the High Court, but if it was found to be invalid, would that have basically wiped the whole patent process out? No, no. So actually, in this in the Grimmer case, um, in the High Court. Uh, the court, the judge, Judge Floyd found claim one to be invalid over the prior art, but that that was okay. So, so it didn't wipe out the case um, because Grimmer could rely on claims seventeen, seventeen and twenty-four. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so you, you so, if, um, so what happens? It's a good question because what happens is if the court finds that, for example, in this case, claim seventeen was valid and infringed, um, you can rewrite the patent to save it. So what, what happens is effectively the feature of claim 17 is introduced into claim one, and then claim one is no longer invalid because the prior art did not have the feature of claim 17. Does that make okay, sense? yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But, yeah. but there can yeah. be situations where it does create a problem. So if you've, if you've added in a new feature, so let's say you claim that it can be 3D printed, and if that was a requirement in all the claims, you can no longer remove that feature. So, because to do so would be to broaden your claim, and you're thus in a, what we call the uh, the added subject matter trap, and that you've added something, yeah. you've added something that you can't remove it. So you have to yeah, no, yeah, sure. But assuming that claim one is the broadest, and then all the yeah. other subsequent yeah. claims can be added back to claim one. That's great. So you still have, yeah. Okay. That, that's right. So, so in this case, it was a bit weird because actually the Court of Appeal revisited the question and they actually said, they, they looked at it afresh and they said, actually, you know, claim one is valid. But in the High Court, it was held invalid. But Chris, it is a really good question because actually what happens is when you exchange expert reports, you get a really deep understand, a deeper understanding of the other side's case. And you may decide, do you know what? We are not going to succeed on claim one. So then the first thing you do going into court is, because expert evidence is, you know, exchanged I don't know, a couple of weeks before trial, hopefully at least. Um, but then you get the skeleton arguments a few days before trial. And you might have decided this is something you want to do, but then you get the skeleton argument, you say, yes, we're definitely going to do this. And you would make an application on day one, you know, to amend your claim one, to introduce, say, the feature of claim 17. Yeah, okay, so if you know from the opposite side that you're going to get challenged on claim one, yeah, you, can strength, you can strengthen it, you can strengthen it by bringing in latter claims to support it. Yeah, and then what yeah, the court okay. does in terms of management is they, they will penalise you in costs. If you run arguments that, um, you know, it's clear on the face of the evidence presented in the court that you shouldn't have been running, that was a bad argument. You'll be, so even if you win, 
you might get some of your costs taken away from you because you ran bad points. So you're always very keen to adjust your case in the light of the evidence that's thrown up or the arguments that's thrown up. Yeah, sure. And I had a follow up question later. Sorry, it's the um, the issue of having the inventor, one of the inventors, or an inventor from a patent as a witness or as an expert. That's not a a done thing. No, not usually. It can be. Very it has to be independent. Yeah. Or, yes, and also, um, yeah. That that's a key point that the inventor is so focused on what he thought he invented, but actually. May, that may not be important for the, the trial. Remember I said at the beginning, the case often focuses down on some narrow aspect and mm. um, the, the inventor, because he's so steeped in it, he, he may not be able to put himself away from his view of, of what the invention is to the particular aspect that's in dispute. But also remember that all the witnesses that you present to the court can be cross-examined by the other side's barrister. And so putting your inventor up there can be very unhelpful. Mm. So in a similar way to the MD of Karimia that went on the stand? Well, yeah, I, I just well, think that was probably a bit unfortunate because as I say, um, two aspects of that are, you know, reading the transcripts are that, um, you know, his hearing wasn't that good. He was speaking in not his mother tongue. And I don't think he came across that well. And you know, maybe some of the criticism of the judges was a little bit unfair. Um, but yes, you have to think very carefully about who you uh, give, who you get to provide written evidence because they will be, they can be cross-examined. So if you yeah. think that they're not going to come across well, probably be best not to um, put their evidence in, in, yeah, in writing. Mm, great. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm just conscious of time actually, so I think we probably need to um, draw it to a close now. There are there are a few questions in the chat which maybe you could have a look at afterwards. But uh, I'm I'm very happy to. I, and uh, if anyone wants to stay on, I'm you know, yeah. I'm okay, I'm very happy. So to. I'll I'll just draw it to a, a, a close. So so thank you, Michael, for for an excellent presentation. They're really interesting, uh, and 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 also thanks to Marks and Clarks for the series of lectures they've done for us. Um, please do contact them if you'd like any further guidance. Um, the previous presentations are also available on our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining today and hope you'll join us for our next lecture on the 14th of June, where we'll be joined by I Agree member Julian Sparry, who will be talking about the management of disease outbreaks in livestock. So all I have to say is thanks again for joining and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.